Um, welcome everyone again. Um, thank you all for joining us today for the Spring 2024 Humanities Research Center's Work in Progress Seminar. My name is Chris Shin, and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. Um, I'm also the Director of the Health Humanities Lab and the Acting Director of the Humanities Research Center for the Spring of 2024, while the Director, Christina Stanshu, is serving as a Fulbright Scholar um, in Ontario, Canada. The Works in Progress Seminar enables VCU faculty in the humanities and humanistic social sciences to share their research in progress in, in a 35 to 40 minute um, project presentation and obtain feedback in a 15 to 20 minute Q&A. If you'd like um, to apply for a Work in Progress Seminar, the form is linked on our website and Ronnie will pop it into the chat. Thanks, Ronnie. I'd like to thank the College of Humanities and Sciences, the amazing Ronnie Sisava, and the Acting Assistant Director, Eli Costin, for their support and help with organizing and promoting this event. I'd like now to introduce to you um, our presenter for today, Jessica Trisco darden um, Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the In Security Lab at BCU. She additionally directs the Security and Foreign Policy Initiative at William & Mary's Global Research Institute and is a non-resident fellow at the George Washington University's Program on Extremism. Dr. Trisco Darden was previously an assistant professor at American University's School of International Service, a Jean Kirkpatrick Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and a visiting scholar at Yale University's Program on Order, Conflict, and Violence. She has served as a consultant to the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism. Dr. Trisco Darden's research focuses on the relationship between gender, conflict, law, and international development. Um, and we'll see the convergence of these interests in her um, presentation for today. She's the author of three university press books and is currently completing her fourth, The Accused, How Women Escaped Justice for Nazi War Crimes. She has published peer review articles on gender and conflict, political violence, legal accountability for perpetrators and alliance dynamics, and has contributed op-eds and commentary on international politics and conflict to a number of newspapers and has been interviewed by numerous media organizations and podcasts. Please join me in welcoming Jessica to our event today uh, where we will learn more about her current project. Um, Please feel free to post your questions using the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen, um, and then Jessica will get to those um, during the Q&A session at the end of her presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining me uh, this rainy, rainy day. I'm so excited to see uh, students amongst the guests, my colleagues from the Writing Center. Uh, really glad to have you two and to the many names that I don't recognize. Thank you for taking time out of your day. I'm going to share uh, some of my current research, um, which examines women's Nazi era crimes. And before we get into the substance of it, uh, I wanna thank, of course, the Humanities Research Center for this opportunity, but in particular, Hillary Levinson, uh, who's here today, and my memory lab colleagues. I spent uh, six years at a policy school, two years at a think tank, uh, and never imagined I would be embraced so warmly by my humanities colleagues. And I am I'm very grateful to the HRC for this. Uh, this research was also supported by a uh, College of Humanities and Sciences seed grant, as well as the OVPRI Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences Award. And most importantly, um, was supported by my amazing uh, undergrad and graduate research team, some of whom have worked with me for more than a year. Um, so it is on this foundation that I was able to build all of this research. So I want to start off with the puzzle of Nazi women and the place that they occupy in our imagination. Uh, a colleague mentioned this song to me earlier this week written by the great Woody Guthrie. Uh, it's a song about Ilse Cook, who was the wife of the commandant of Buchenwald. And Ilse really stoked the post-war American imagination. She was tried uh, in a American military trial. She was tried in a civilian German trial and really became emblematic of the monstrosity of women's participation in Nazi uh, era crimes. She herself was never an agent of the Nazi state. She was simply the wife of a high-ranking Nazi officer. 
And it was never definitively proven uh, that she engaged in crimes against humanity directly. Um, yet her story became really emblematic of this phenomenon. Much of what we know about women who engaged in Nazi era crimes is based on this handful of stories. Oh, sorry, sorry to, to interrupt you, Jessica, but the slides are, um, are not, not moving. moving. Okay, no. I don't know how so, to do that. Um, if you put huh. it on play from the start, click the button that says play from the start. Yeah. And then, oh. Uh, it's not working? No, we're, now we're on who, who were the, oh, okay. Well, at least now that's moving, oh. but we're, we're, we're seeing them all. Look, we're seeing your- um, The slide your, deck. But at least we, if you just move down. Oh, okay. Let's try this again. Now, do you see them? Yes. Thank you. Okay, we have a Mac technical problem. All right, well, here's my wonderful image of, of Ilsa. Sorry for not paying attention to the chat. Um, you know, these stories really became used as smoke screens for the broader phenomenon of women's engagement in Nazi society and Nazi war crimes more broadly. So the project that I'm going to be laying out for you today really moves beyond a handful of high profile individual cases to examine the participation of hundreds of women in Nazi era war crimes. Um, so the project aims to put these women and their crimes in context, uh, in part by examining the relevance of gender, class, religion, and other sources of social and institutional power. These included women's marital status, parental status, whether or not they were members of the Nazi party or affiliated women's organizations, um, but also their spouse's status and the way that that enhanced uh, the authority of women. The crimes uh, that these women allegedly committed range quite significantly. Roughly one fifth of the women that I examine were involved in the Action T4 euthanasia program, which led to the medicalized murder of at least 70,000 adults and approximately 5,000 children. These murders took place in German medical facilities, uh, most commonly mental institutions. The overwhelming uh, majority of the crimes that I examined were crimes of denunciation. When a woman would file a report to the Gestapo, to the SS, to another security agency, accusing an individual uh, of an act, uh, that accusation would then be investigated. And in cases where the individual uh, who was reported on was deported um, or otherwise uh, murdered or disappeared, subsequent post-war investigations aimed to hold the initial denouncers or informers responsible for the death of those individuals. We, of course, also have violent crimes that occurred in concentration camps. Uh, these were primarily conducted by women who were employed as guards in those institutions, um, but we also have uh, imprisoned populations within those camps serving as overseers. So uh, a segment of the women that I examine are actually Jewish uh, concentration camp prisoners who were then prosecuted after the war for crimes that they committed as overseers in concentration camps. End stage crimes refer to crimes that occurred in the context of the uh, mass evacuation of camps uh, during the uh, end stage of the war. So what do we learn from looking at uh, more than 350 cases pertaining to these crimes? Well, we learn a lot about the accused. Uh, so these are female concentration camp guards at Ravensbrück, which was a primarily uh, female concentration camp that also had forced labor facilities. 
Uh, we learned that the accused ranged in age very significantly. At the time of their trials, the women accused of Nazi era crimes ranged from the age of 18 to the age of 96, uh, the most recent being uh, sentenced at the age of 97 uh, in 2022. Uh, we know that these women came from a myriad of backgrounds. Some were born into high status, upper class families. Um, some were born into lives of poverty. We know that they were married, divorced, single. We know that at least 15% of the women were mothers. Um, we know that they had very different lived experiences and very different statuses within Nazi society. And so rather than taking the stories of a few of these women as archetypal, uh, I examine the diversity at, and the differences between these women to understand what patterns gave rise to women's participation uh, in Nazi era crimes. And to do this, I develop a bit of a typology where I examine the nexus of women's social and institutional power. And I come up with roughly four uh, characteristics, right? Ideal types of women perpetrators. Women who had limited access to social power and limited access to institutional power are discussed in the book as entangled victims, right? Those who were victimized by the Nazi system, but then themselves became victimizers. And the most emblematic of this phenomenon are Jewish bloc leaders who enforced order uh, within particular dormitories uh, within concentration camps. But we also have those who had limited access to institutional power. They weren't members of the party. They weren't married to high ranking Nazi officials. They didn't even necessarily buy into Nazi ideology per se, but they were able to navigate the Nazi system in ways that benefited them personally, in ways that elevated their social status, right? And increased the benefits that accrued to them. Uh, and I label these individuals as opportunistic beneficiaries. So what we see through the case files are uh, typically German women who are informing on their Jewish neighbors, their spouses, their sisters-in-law in ways that really benefit them personally because they have the social authority to be credible uh, as denouncers. We also have women who have access to institutional power, primarily through their employment in Nazi institutions, um, but have limited social power. And these individuals really become servants of the Nazi social order with limited agency. So for instance, um, when uh, the Nazi party takes over uh, the apparatus of the German state, all public servants, right, including nurses in public hospitals, teachers, et cetera, become employees uh, of the Nazi state. And while they have some agency um, and the ability to refuse to execute certain orders, right, this means uh, an automatic loss of their employment and limited uh, job prospects. Uh, and of course, at the apex of social and institutional power, we have what I refer to as empowered perpetrators. And some of you received uh, a few of the, the case narratives related to those individuals. These were individuals who had high social power and status within Nazi society, but also were strongly linked to sources of institutional power. They worked as secretaries uh, in the Gestapo. They were in female affiliated units of the SS. They worked in concentration camps. Uh, and these empowered perpetrators both had a commitment to the social order and a personal benefit that accrued to them from that order's enforcement. What I find is that after the war, these women are held to account through a range of different mechanisms. And one of the most important mechanisms uh, is community level accountability. So the communities that these women were part of um, 
targeted them for punishment after the war. And the most kind of visceral form of this was the use of public shaming. Uh, and this occurred throughout France in a phenomenon known as uh, Le Femme Tendue, the shorn women. Women were uh, forced to have their hair publicly uh, shaved. In this instance, they were also marked with swastikas. In other instances, they were forcibly stripped down to their underclothes and in some instances stripped completely naked. They were paraded through town squares in trucks, uh, forced to hold signs that read collaborator, uh, and in some instances marched through the streets along with children who had been fathered by uh, German soldiers and members of the occupying forces. This was reported in 77 out of 90 departments in France. So it was a very widespread phenomenon that identified and marked these women. Um, in some instances, public shaming led to ostracism, uh, but in others, the ostracism occurred independent of a broader public shaming apparatus. So for instance, in parts of the Soviet Union uh, that were occupied by German forces, we see a major spike in divorce rates as a result of adultery. Uh, so women engaged in what is now referred to as horizontal collaboration. There is a kind of double entendre there where they uh, formed relationships with German soldiers, uh, either as a form of protection, uh, or as a way of obtaining benefits, or perhaps because they truly fell in love. Uh, these women were uh, divorced after the war and in some instances expelled from their communities. The most extreme form of uh, community level accountability took the form of extrajudicial killings. And we have very, very poor estimates of the number of women who were murdered uh, during the waning days of the war. Um, but estimates from France suggest that up to 20% of the 9,000 reporting killings may have involved women. Uh, and these included murders not only of women who worked for the Gestapo or the occupying governments, but also those uh, who were prosecuted through uh, regular judicial channels, but whose sentences were seen as too lenient. Uh, so the community sought to enforce higher levels of sentencing. Another important form of community level accountability uh, took place within Jewish communities uh, throughout Germany, Europe, Israel, and even into Latin America. And these were the construction of Jewish honor courts. Jewish honor courts were civilian, civic institutions. They were not traditional religious courts known as Beit Deans. Uh, the rabbinate, right, rabbis throughout uh, Europe have been as affected by the Holocaust as any other Jewish population. There simply weren't enough individuals to constitute religious courts. Uh, but also these civic courts dealt with matters that were traditionally beyond the purview of religious courts, which concern themselves with family law. So these courts focused on investigating Jews who had collaborated with the Nazis, primarily in terms of Jewish councils that operated in ghettos, and uh, individuals who took on roles and positions of authority within concentration camps. Um, because of the nature of these positions of authority, there were relatively few women who were implicated. Uh, across Europe, there were only approximately three women who served on Jewish councils, uh, but more women were involved uh, in the concentration camp hierarchy in part because uh, we had a gender segregated population and women were needed to oversee other women. In addition, women could be held accountable by these courts for the crimes perpetrated by their husbands. Uh, the process for Jewish honor courts relied on uh, witness testimony. So an individual would report on another individual who uh, they had known in a concentration camp. They would lay charges against that individual. Um, the defendant would be able to respond to those charges. This primarily took place through written correspondence. The courts had no power to compel individuals to appear before them. Um, and they could only really 
hand down punishments that worked in a Jewish communal context, including, again, expulsion from the Jewish community, um, refusal to participate in religious or community rights, etc. The overarching purpose of these courts was to contain investigations of uh, Jews who had committed Nazi era crimes to Jewish communities. They didn't want those investigations being taken up um, more broadly, but also and perhaps even more importantly, to provide a sense of agency to those within the Jewish community who felt that their victimization wasn't being taken seriously in uh, ongoing criminal investigations. Uh, then, of course, we have state level national accountability, so prosecutions that are being undertaken by governments uh, in the context of East and West Germany, we have some very interesting uh, differences. So in West Germany, we have the formal prosecution of 94 women, more than half of whom are acquitted. Uh, in comparison, in East Germany, we have um, a much higher number of women, almost 250, only one fifth of whom are acquitted, right? So we have both more prosecutions in East Germany and more sentences being handed down. So three quarters of all women prosecuted in East Germany receive a terminal sentence, so ranging from a month to uh, up to 15 years in prison, typically. Um, but we also have three and a half percent of women being prosecuted receiving life sentences and two women being sentenced to death. Uh, surprisingly, in West Germany, we have a similar number of women being sentenced to death, but overall uh, a much lower number of women who are receiving sentences at all. Uh, so what does this look like in terms of a more gendered analysis? So if we look specifically at these acquittal rates, and, and remember that 50% of women being prosecuted in West Germany are being acquitted, we see differential outcomes for women who are prosecuted in group trials that include men as opposed to women who are prosecuted as individuals or in group trials that feature only women, right? So if you're a woman on trial in West Germany with male co-defendants, you are significantly more likely to be acquitted for denunciation or concentration camp related crimes. The um, exception to this is euthanasia, where we had the vast majority um, of individuals who participated in that program be nurses or female doctors. Um, and women who were being tried alongside women had much, much higher acquittal rates than those who were being tried alongside men. And this is for one very important reason. The women who were being uh, prosecuted for euthanasia alongside men were doctors who were being prosecuted alongside male doctors, whereas the women who were being prosecuted alongside women were all uh, primarily nurses. But this kind of gender benefit, right, doesn't play out in East Germany. Being tried alongside men does not get you noticeably better uh, acquittal rates in East Germany as opposed to being tried alongside women. So this kind of gendered effect of co-defendants is really only observed in the West, which raises really important broader questions about how the East German and West German judicial systems were approaching uh, the gender of the defendant. Uh, what we find is that East Germany handed down much more uh, significant sentences than West German courts. So East Germany uh, is the big, big spike at the top. This is the length of sentences in months, um, or sorry, the number of sentences handed down in each year. So we see uh, that by the late 1940s, East Germany is sentencing uh, roughly 50 women every year, whereas West Germany has taken on a, a lower number of prosecutions. Um, and again, we have comparable uh, levels of death and life sentences being handed down. 
where we really uh, are able to unpack some of these gender differences is looking at average sentence length. So this is average sentence length in months, um, and it's a comparison between uh, East German men, West German men, East German women in the gray, and West German women in the burgundy. And so what we find is that East German women right, on average, received more significant sentences than both West German men and West German women in the case of euthanasia. Um, and interestingly, we also find that women received higher average length of sentence for things like concentration camp crimes. And this is primarily because the men are being sentenced uh, to life or to death. Uh, whereas women are not receiving these sorts of extreme penalties. Where we see relatively little difference though is the crime of denunciation. Again, this is informing on someone uh, and across the board informants received relatively similar uh, levels of penalty after the war. There are, of course, also transnational trials happening, primarily uh, in 1946. We have a series of British military trials, such as the Bergen-Belsen trial, that led to the execution of at least 20 German women. Um, the most famous of these is the blonde situated in the center of this uh, image. Uh, Irma Gress. She was referred to uh, as the beastess of Belsen. She was very young when she came uh, to be a concentration camp guard starting at the age of 17 or 18. Uh, and she was executed by the official uh, British hangman at the age of 22. Um, and you can tell from this brief press, press excerpt how sensationalized um, this initial batch of women were, right? Irma's described as blonde, attractive. She becomes this kind of image for the later sexualization of concentration camp guards. Um, but importantly, right, the other women um, who appear in the photograph with her do not receive this same sort of um, sexualized and hyperbolic treatment, right? So even the press is imposing its own lens on these female perpetrators. Um, so what do I think about all of this? I think there's a lot going on here and I'm glad that I have a book to figure it out uh, as opposed to an article. Um, but my main conclusions are that women could call on multiple sources of social and institutional power in navigating uh, the Nazi system and deciding when and how to interact with that system. Um, I find that post-war accountability measures were both explicitly and implicitly gendered. So most importantly, women's complete exclusion from the legal profession in Germany meant that there were no um, women judges, women prosecutors, right? Women attorneys who could engage in this process. Post-war justice was exclusively a domain of men. Uh, so when women defendants came to court, they were both subject to the male gaze and to um, the prevailing gender norms. Most women actually benefited from these gender norms, right? Which lessened their agency, which saw women as the responsibility of men, the responsibility of their spouses. Um, women were able to claim that they were simply following doctor's orders and therefore not responsible uh, for their medicalized murders, that they were doing what their superiors told them to do. And this was a credible argument coming from women. Um, but at the same time, while most women benefited from norms that kind of le lessened their agency and saw them as having really constrained field of operation, a few women were rendered exceptional, both in popular culture and in legal processes. And we would say they were made an example of, um, but I think it's much, much more complex than that. Um, the systems that they were 
navigating were not designed to address um, their complex statuses within society and the extent of the crimes that they had committed. And this ties into a, a much larger body of work on women in political violence that examines exceptionally violent women as mothers, monsters, or whores that focuses on kind of the monstrosity of violent women. Um, and while this is not a major focus of the book, in part because I'm arguing against that narrative, it certainly is uh, the case in terms of a number of the perpetrators that I examine. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it up here and hopefully you will all have many wonderful questions for me as I continue developing this project. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jessica. Um, we'll now open the floor for questions. And as a reminder, um, you can post your questions using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also use the chat, but the Q&A might be better. Um, so we already have a question from Hillary Levinson. Um, I wonder if you could speak to how you see prosecutions and guilty sentences or lack thereof as fitting in with broader national post-war aims and projects, as in West versus East Germany, most prominently, for example, but other national contexts as well, if you have examples you want to point to. Yeah, it's really interesting. This actually came up earlier this week, in part because um, the limited prosecution of women that we see in West Germany uh, can be linked in many ways to the need to have women deeply involved in post-war reconstruction. So in West Germany in particular, we have a phenomenon of women who are physically rebuilding um, infrastructure, right? Who are brick by brick reestablishing infrastructure and who are really uh, lauded for that engagement. We also have very practical constraints. Um, so for instance, if we look at nurses in particular, they are state employees, they remain, you know, public sector state employees. Uh, but more importantly, there's no backup workforce. So if you start prosecuting hundreds of nurses, you do not have any nurses to serve in your hospitals and healthcare institutions. Um, and so a lot of the dynamics about which women to hold accountable, when to hold them accountable, played into the, the broader themes of what was necessary for rebuilding a post-war society. Uh, in West Germany, we have uh, the continuance of what is largely a Nazi judiciary, right, that then has more lenient, um, lenient approaches to uh, sentencing. Now, in East Germany, it's a bit of a different case, right? We have a, the purging of the judiciary, the purging of political leadership, a much more activist um, uh, prosecutorial thrust, right? But at the same time, there's still this struggle of who to hold accountable and how. And so what I argue we see in uh, East Germany is this much greater emphasis on denunciations because this was something that the Soviet uh, occupying authorities understood the power of and understood the significance of, um, that it spoke to issues of loyalty and collaboration. Um, and that was why their emphasis was there. Thanks. We have a number of other questions. Um, thank you for this powerful presentation. Will your work apply some of your findings to trends that are still happening today? Do you see similar gender dynamics at play during the current Palestinian genocide? Figures such as Daniela Weiss, uh, Weiss come to mind. I think that this research um, is strongly linked to research that I've done, for instance, on women affiliated with the Islamic State terrorist group. So similarly there, we had a patriarchal social organization, right, that emphasized women's important role as mothers in building a new pure society and establishing the caliphate where women were lauded for the number of children that they could give birth to. 
uh, in similar ways that Nazi Germany lauded women based on their birth rate. Uh, and we've had this kind of post ISIS conversation about the tens of thousands of women and children who are still in displaced persons camp in northeast Syria over whether they should be held accountable for joining Islamic State, whether they were simply following their husbands, whether they had agency, whether the children um, had any roles in the groups or not. Um, and I see very, very similar discussions happening at the international legal level pertaining to the prosecution and repatriation of women in ISIS, um, as I do with women in Nazi Germany. And I've, I've written several pieces on that, um, in part because I think we fail to understand the ways in which women are empowered in seemingly patriarchal organizations, right? That from our Western liberal lens exist solely to keep women, women in the home. And actually this comparison between Islamic State Group and, and Nazi Germany can help us understand the contemporary ways in which women are still really drawn to these sorts of organizations and narratives and see them as really empowering, whether it's in the context of ISIS or um, in the right wing kind of trad wife um, approach. Um, the next question is from Emily Raymond. Um, how high was the bar for women to be prosecuted? Were there examples of women who evaded prosecution that you thought should have been, or alternatively should not have been punished? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I do include um, narratives of women who were acquitted or who otherwise had their cases dismissed, because I do think it is a flaw of research on women in criminal justice or, or women in, in political violence more broadly to only focus on those who were punished, right? Or those who have really high profile cases. Um, so there are some beautiful um, and in some instances heartbreaking stories of women who were prosecuted after the war that should not have been. Um, in terms of women who invade, who evaded prosecution, it's it's a very difficult story because we only really know about many of these women after they have been identified by survivors, right? So I can't really tell you the universe of women who committed Nazi era crimes because we only have evidence of their crimes um, through, through the trials and prosecutions. Um, I do think though that there are very important questions about the sentences that some women received um, and mitigating factors. So in some instances, we have things like um, the women's children being considered as a mitigating factor that if a woman received too harsh of a sentence, uh, their children would be left without a mother. Um, obviously, such similar sentiments were not extended to the men who were sentenced to death or life in prison. Um, we also have age considered as a mitigating factor for women. Um, and so a, a kind of broader array of issues were considered for women um, than were considered for men. What gives me hope um, are these more recent cases in Germany where they've actually gone back and prosecuted individuals who in the 1940s and 50s weren't deemed worthy of prosecution, um, that they really shifted their perspective on that and tried to track down those individuals and hold them accountable for their roles. Thanks. Um, we have a comment from Olivia Landry. Fascinating project. You may be interested in the 2023 film, The Zone of Interest, about Rudolf Huss's Huss's wife. Um, and then another, uh, I don't know if you have a comment about that. 
I will just want to say that, man, I I have watched um, now a lot of Nazi sexploitation films as a result of this. <laughs> and also uh, the Kate Winslet movie, The Reader. I, I think Olivia and I, I need to uh, co-author a paper on this whole genre of like Nazi women films. So hopefully that'll be a wonderful HRC spawned collaboration. Um, in your abstract, you mentioned how proceedings in Germany would be compared to proceedings in Israel. Do you have any preliminary findings or predictions for what your research may reveal or imply there? Absolutely, yeah. So um, Dan Porat, who's an Israeli legal scholar, uh, has gone into the archives to look at the recently opened um, prosecutions of individuals under the uh, Nazi collaborators law. So um, based on Porat's research, there are about five or six women who were prosecuted under that law um, exclusively, again, for their roles as overseers in concentration camp. Uh, concentration camps, their roles as capos. Um, and so what we uh, find in examining these cases of female perpetrators tried in Israel uh, is again that they're uh, there's kind of a, a hesitancy to assign these women full agency and guilt. And perhaps this is appropriate because they were, of course, imprisoned in concentration camps uh, when they committed their crimes. What's really interesting in one of the cases, um, I forgot the woman's name at the moment, but she was pregnant during the time of her trial. So she actually was not held in detention. She was uh, released. Um, but additionally, the uh, individuals who testified on her behalf found that she had actually used her position in the camp hierarchy to help people. She was able to get them medical attention when they needed it. She was able to distribute rations in a way so that those who were sick were uh, able to receive additional rations. And that even though she used violence to maintain order, which, which was a fundamental uh, requirement of her job, that overall she used her position to benefit the community. Um, and that is in contrast to other women who were prosecuted um, in Israel where it was found that they were very uh, exploitative of their situation. Similarly, when we look to Jewish honor court hearings, um, the Krakow um, uh, court, right, or the, sorry, the Warsaw court, um, handled several cases pertaining to women um, who were wives of members of Jewish councils um, or who were wives of kapos. So they themselves weren't overseeing individuals in, in concentration camps, but their husbands were, and they benefited from their husband's privileges. So some of those women um, were held to account, not in formal legal trials, as was the case in the state of Israel, but in these community-based trials. Uh, and so what I think that on the whole, both the Israeli and the Jewish honor court trials tell us is that these communities were really struggling to understand the extent of agency uh, in the ghettos and in the camps, and also the recognition that individuals made choices. Um, and we see a lot of this reckoning happening in post-Holocaust writings of individuals, for instance, like Primo Levi, who's describing the gray zone. Um, and, in reckonings with guilt over survival, survivorship, right? Because if you received additional rations, if you didn't have to work because your husband was a capo, it, it really did mean that you had a higher chance of surviving uh, the camps. And so there was a lot of resentment amongst um, concentration camp prisoners uh, that were directed after the war at these individuals. Thank These you. are great questions. Thank you. Are there any questions that you would want to pose um, to the um, to the to the attendees um, that might help you clarify some questions that you have about your project? Yeah, that's great. Um, I think that one of the things that I would like to know more about is the degree to which. Um, 
this emphasis on kind of post-war history and post-war justice speaks to contemporary concerns, right? So um, we had that question come up, but in, you know, in my mind, um, this project is not just a book. We're also creating an interactive website that's intended for kind of public education about women's participation. Um, I think it's linked to ongoing debates about how the criminal justice system deals with women um, and violent women in particular, but I'd just be really interested in knowing what themes uh, it may have made you think of. It occurred to me that I, I posed that question, but I'm, I didn't really leave a space for people to respond. So, I mean, if people want to drop in the chat, I mean, I, and I could just say as a as someone who was trained um, mostly as a literary scholar um, and who has a, a background in the humanities, when I was reading these um, accounts, um, what struck me was the extent to which these short narratives exceeded any kind of attempt to try to frame them within these categories. Um, I, I saw them all operating at various moments, even in the context of like a one paragraph little, um, and then they, you know, summoned somebody from authority, then they they punched somebody in the face. I mean, these were horrible stories. Um, and yet I saw um, aspects of each of these, I mean, um, each of these categories at various moments. Um, and so maybe this is a question, this is a disciplinary question as much as it is like a thematic um, methodological one. It's not really a question, it's more like, I guess, an observation. Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. And I think that, um, yes, it's hard to put boundaries on the human experience, right? Uh, and it's hard to draw lines between uh, the conduct of individuals. I think the value of the framework that I'm proposing is to acknowledge that, uh, to acknowledge the structural conditions under which women operated and to identify some similarities in those structural conditions. Because otherwise, right, if we are just assuming that these individuals' experiences were also unique and also distinct, then we're, you know, left without the ability to generalize. And as social scientists, I'm like a generalizer, um, but I'm not a universalizer, right? So I don't want to make any particular story uh, and argue that it's universal, but I also don't want to argue that it's particularistic. So I'm trying to operate in this middle ground where I think that we can make some um, conceptual groupings and try and derive some patterns from those groupings. Um, but yeah, I think these are, these are ultimately fuzzy, fuzzy boundaries. Um, and depending on one's read of the situation or one's interpretation of the case file, uh, you could approach that differently. Um, we have one more comment and then, um, I'm interested in extradition of known Nazis from Argentina. Is there a chance of a future study focusing specifically on the extradition and prosecution of Nazis who resided in Argentina post-war? I appreciate your time and found this study and presentation very interesting. Thank you so much. I actually got a question on Tuesday about Norway, and I was like, I don't know anything about Norway. And similarly, I don't know anything about Argentina. Um, what I, you know, I think with this sort of project, the question is, how do you scope it? Um, and, uh, you know, this project actually really came out of my engagement with the work of Wendy Lower, who's a renowned uh, Holocaust and German historian. And she wrote a book called Hitler's Furies that really focused on maybe five to seven women who were teachers, who were wives, who were um engaged in the uh, German occupation of Eastern Europe. And I kept wondering, like, how many women actually 
engaged in this work? How many women were actually engaged in these crimes? And I, I contacted uh, Professor Lower and other scholars asking, well, well, do you know how many women were prosecuted? Do you know how many women? And eventually uh, the very kind librarians at the US uh, Holocaust Memorial and Museum told me to count them and pointed me to the, the German case files where I could count them. And, and being a political scientist instead of a historian, I made an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but the point of this anecdote is that um, it is extremely hard to find these women in archives and in case files because in every context, they are an overwhelming minority, right? So even as in the Israeli context, they're less than 15% of all prosecutions. In um, the Polish Jewish honor court, there are about 14%. Um, you know, in the context of West Germany, they're just a drop in the bucket. Um, and so I would assume, you know, similarly, um, that this is the case globally. Uh, and the other thing is that a lot of these archives remain sealed. So Israel opened its archives 70 years after the prosecutions on the assumption that most of the people involved would be dead by then. Um, and so we will really only know more about these post-war prosecutions in the coming years. So I will keep an eye out for cases uh, involving women who fled to Argentina. I think the question of um, women who fled is linked more broadly to the earlier question about individuals who weren't prosecuted. And I think we simply don't know very much about those individuals. Um, because no one's putting in their obituary that they happen to be a former Nazi, unfortunately, or fortunately. Thank you. Um, so thanks again uh, to Dr. Trisco Darden. Um, and I hope to see you all at noon this Monday, February 26th, at the next HRC Meet VCU Authors event when Olivia Landry, who's, I think he was here today, um, will present her latest book, A Decolonizing Ear, Documentary Film Disrupts the Archive. So please um, register. Thanks, Ronnie just dropped the registration in the chat. That's this Monday at noon. Um, and thanks again to Dr. Trisco Darden. And